I want to share with you some things that have been influences on me and kind of formed how I approach the work that I do. Um, when I speak about work, whether it's to students, whether it's just um, to anyone who's interested or when I think about how I come up with the things that I do, something that's very important to me is being authentic and kind of tapping into what my influences have been and um, trying to approach things from an, an emotional space um, so that I can get personality into them and, and do things that resonate and connect with people. So. Um, my talk is called Emotional Type, and I want to share a few things um, that inspire me to do the work that I do. So first will be, will be graffiti. Um, as it was mentioned in the intro, I live in New York City. I'm not from New York originally. I'm from Connecticut. And um, a large part of why I live in New York or, or was drawn to New York was seeing graffiti on the subway as a kid. Um, it's the thing that um, introduced me to typography. I didn't call it that. I didn't know what that was, but seeing letter forms larger than life and all types of colors and different styles, some that were completely legible, some that I had to look at for days and still couldn't figure out what they said. Those were the sorts of things that moved me and, and made a huge impression on me with lettering. And it's, it's what made me um, start drawing and focusing on letter forms. Um, prior to that, I've always drawn as a kid, but it was drawing superheroes and, and figures and different sort of things. But graffiti is what made me shift to drawing letter forms. And at a point, I started to discover or be exposed to people who approach graffiti in a totally different way. And Espo, Stephen Powers, is an artist who had he really should, did a lot to shift my um, understanding of letter forms and seeing them in the context and seeing things on the street that were very balanced and precise and measured out. So this, you know, the, the piece on the top here is one that I saw on the West Side Highway. And I would, whenever I was able and in a car, I would make a point and go out of my way and look at this and it moved me. And I would talk to anybody who would listen about how this piece of graffiti was typography. Um, and, you know, this had a huge, huge impression on me and kind of seeing the juxtaposition of how work would impact you differently based on the form or the venue with where you saw it. So this is another piece of um, Espo's work, which is much more recent. Um, I was in London doing a project and walking through Shoreditch and I happened to look up and saw this piece that he did and, you know, I didn't need to see his name. I knew who did it the second I saw it. Um, and, and this was beautiful to me because this now is taking the dimension and the shading and all of the things that you would do when you're setting type or maybe designing for client work or whatever. Um, instead of getting a sign made, he's doing this sign painting, but it's still graffiti and it's still, there's this blurred line and it shows kind of the commonality between the things that um, had always resonated to me. So <clears throat> I, was, I was super happy to see this. And even though I was in a different country, it made me feel home. It made me feel grounded in something that was familiar. So I grew up in a time where, you know, personal expression was huge. And it still is, but the way in which we were expressing ourselves had a lot to do with our personal style, our clothes, our haircuts. I learned how to be a barber and I got very good at it. But one of the things that was appealing to me was at the time that I came up, people wanted designs in their head. So I learned how to cut hair. I learned how to do designs. I could write your name. I could put a logo in there. Like some people wanted a logo of a team or just anything to be unique and, and kind of stand out. So none of these are haircuts that I did, but I wanted to put this in because at the moment doing the stuff was important, but I didn't have an opportunity to document it. So I don't have pictures of my work, but this is kind of the feel. And I'll point out the, pit, the picture on the left, the barber, who the, the guy getting his hair cut is Big Daddy Kane. He is a huge influence on me as a rapper. And one of his dancers is cutting his hair. He had dancers named Scoob and Scrap. So if you look, his pants have a Fendi pattern on it. So I'm going to kind of come back to this high-end luxury stuff in a minute, but I wanted to kind of call that out for a second. So <clears throat> I told you how I became aware of 
uh, typography and letter forms. But when I became aware of branding in that context, I'm going to say, you know, I saw things around my house, whether it was, you know, the general electric refrigerator, I noticed the logo or some, the Zenith TV or the, you know, whatever the, the logo on the car, I noticed these things, but I feel like Nike was my introduction to the understanding of branding and, or brand and how it's represented through a letter form. So this shoe connected with me, like just seeing the back because I'm a little bit of a sneakerhead and because this had an impact on my life, I don't need to see the whole shoe. I see that swoosh in the back and the colors. I know exactly what shoe this is. I know what grade I was in. I know who worked at Foot Locker, who hooked me up to get these shoes at the time they came out. But this was something that just kind of made me pay attention to branding from a, from a perspective of typography. I later learned that that mark is called the swoosh because um, I would just call it the Nike symbol or that, you know, now when I look at it, I see how the italicized type really expresses motion, as does the swoosh or air in that sans font. And Futura separated the way that it does. It really reflects what the word is saying. So I didn't have the language to understand this at the time. But now looking back, I see how on point this stuff was. And by paying attention to how these brands evolved and present themselves, I got to learn a lot more. So, you know, the, on the back, you might have one version of the swoosh or the, the logo. You would have the logo on the bottom of the shoe. On the tongue, it might be presented in a different form. So you get these contexts of how things play together or are reinterpreted for different applications. I also, by paying attention to Nike, you would see when they would introduce different products, they would have a whole bunch of other logos that kind of complemented or gave an identity within the bigger system. So the flight logo, it took me a long time. Like I just got it. I was like, oh, that's a big F. But now I'm like, it's such a simple shape. It's a triangle that by reducing parts of it, you get something that becomes a literal letter of the alphabet or even the Jordan logo. Um, it becomes something that you can take the type away and it still has this import, incredible symbolism and, and connection. It doesn't get lost. So there's things that the words communicate and there's things that can complement, or you can still get this feeling from things in the complete absence of words, but through symbols. I love how even to this day, there are certain things that Nike does, not only Nike, but other brands. But since I'm talking about Nike, I'll point out this, um, this particular shoe box, where it's one that kind of it keeps the legacy and tradition of a piece of their brand that has been consistent for many years, but it still adds a new layer on top of it. And I love how things can honor, um, they can be present while honoring the past and being uh, forward leaning. So I mentioned those Fendi pants. Here we are at Gucci. Um, like Fendi, there's a, you know, Gucci, Fendi, Chanel, there are all these symmetrical shapes that are very simple, that are letter forms, that are beautiful in their simplicity. They're easy to draw. I would draw the Gucci logo or the Fendi logo on all types of things as a kid. And it had nothing to do with understanding these luxury houses. I was completely unaware of them. They were introduced to me by Dapper Dan, who had a store uptown and is an innovator. He made clothes and things on his own in the way that he saw fit and he catered to his clientele. Um, he now, you know, the image of the left on the left is Dapper Dan in the eighties and some custom things that he made, um, on the right, you see, you know, him in the current time. And he now, um, you know, if you look him up, you'll see that there's been, there's a long history between he and Gucci, but he now has a custom, a shop through them where they support his designs and supply fabrics and, and things like that. So he's working with them in an official capacity now, but um, I love seeing, I love knowing that my understanding of these brands came from someone who contributed so much to the culture that I love so dearly. So this is not the first time I saw his work, but this is early on. This is an album cover um, that was done for Eric B and Rakim, where he made them custom Gucci suits. And I put Gucci in air quotes because they're not made by Gucci, but this was far more valuable in my eyes than what they were making at the time. And I highlight this because the design has his flavor. When you look at it, I look at this now as a person who designs. If you look at the letters on Eric's jacket, they're not symmetrical, they're not completely proper, but they feel right. And it's all about the feel. So 
I love this. And this is the sort of thing that moves me greatly. So I would see this on album covers, which is something that I studied a lot. I would look through my father's record collection, whether it's Rick James or Tina Marie or whoever, Earth, Wind & Fire, Parliament. I would study album covers and the art. But when I discovered Blue Note work later is what taught me about type standing on its own. It taught me about customizing type. It taught me about working with image and sometimes making type be the lead element or making it get out of the way. And I've studied this work so much through books and things like that. It took years before I actually saw one of the record labels. And when I did, it did not disappoint at all. Um, here's one on the right that you see. And I love how to type this set, but I also fell, fall in love with the unique details, like the bleed on the print, the way that it ages, all of this sort of stuff. It makes me feel something It feels special and unique. It's what makes me feel these are one of a kind sort of pieces. Next up, I love cars. It's a huge influence on me. So here we have the BMW logo and the type that's on the cars. I love the dimensions, the materials chosen. All of that sort of stuff resonates with me. It makes me think of very specific memories or, or moments. I can picture myself driving and listening to music. So sometimes I share on stories or on Instagram. This is, you know, the car that I love that I'm going to get at some point. But when I do it, just to kind of mix new and old, I decided to I often play around with different ideas on Instagram stories. This, the dots and dashes that you see here are actually Morse code. I love that it's a language that's seen and heard, but not really familiar when you see it written. So I like to kind of play around with those things because I like typography as, I, I appreciate the form of it and I like the challenge and see how it's applied differently. Anyone who spent a, enough time with me will tell you it's difficult to walk down the street with me because I get lost in looking at signs and uh, faded typography or just things that you see that a lot of people ignore. So sometimes I will post these things as well. And on the left, you see a sign that has an abundance of logos. I caught this walking down the street in downtown LA last year. On the right is something that's in my neighborhood that I love. And sometimes when I post it, people don't necessarily get why I'm posting it. And I don't really like to explain. So sometimes I'll add something so people who aren't type heads get to appreciate it as well. In addition to being a slow walker, because I'm looking at everything in the street, I also, my, my family members get drawn into impromptu conversations about type. My son gave me a book for my birthday and it has the font Banco on it. And I asked him if it looked familiar to him and it turned into a long discussion and an Instagram post where I pointed out that that font is not only on that book cover, but it's used in the Thrasher logo, which he's very familiar with and the PK Ripper bike logo, which both of these kind of existed around the same time, have a different feeling, different treatment, but I love to be able to kind of share those things as I kind of discover them in the wild. My first favorite artist was Andy Warhol, that he held that spot until I became aware of Jean-Michel Basquiat's work. And when I saw the work that they did together, it blew my mind. Um, this piece is one that's here because it has the familiarity, the familiarity of the Arm and Hammer logo, which is, you know, ubiquitous or was at a time. But I love how Basquiat applied his point of view to it. And I love this kind of contrast and juxtaposition of these, these things. And, and really, this is emblematic of what I try and do in my work is do things that have this kind of timelessness, but I like to interject my way of thinking into them and my perspective. So <clears throat> this piece is another artist whose work has a huge impact on me. And I didn't, I didn't recognize a lot of what she had done in real time. I became aware of Barbara Kruger's work much later on. But I love it for the same reason that I love graffiti. This is letters that are larger than life. They're bigger than you if you stand in front of them. They have an impact. They make you focus on words and their meaning and the font choices. It makes you just hyper aware of um, typography, words, our written language in a way that in this context here just brings me back immediately to graffiti. You can stand in a room full of words and, and it has meaning and impact. And, you know, speaking of her work and meaning and impact, 
a lot of people, her name comes up in the conversation with the Supreme logo. So Supreme is a brand that has, you know, put themselves in a unique position in the way that they have pre presented their brand in the way that it works for people. And they're polarizing, love it or hate it. The one thing that's kind of undeniable is the impact that the, that, that red box with the future type and it has. So, you know, I will find myself walking through the neighborhood here in New York City and I'll come across a line first, just people standing around and you, <laughs> you get the impression quick that you're near the Supreme store and something's dropping that day. And uh -oh, there's something that was skipped here. What I'll say is what we're not seeing at this moment is uh, the Supreme Metro card that, that was produced and that Metro card, the value of a Metro card, aside from what you put the commute on it, is $1. So you would see people lining, lining up to buy Metro cards, which can be, you know, some of them kept them just to have as ephemera or just for the meaning that it held for them personally. But you would also see, if, if the screen loaded, you would see a Metro card being sold for $240. And it's amazing to me that something that is so mundane has such cultural value to the people who are invested in what that means to them. It's literally a Metro card with a red box and some typography on it. And as somebody who appreciates type, it's pretty interesting to see. Um, and understanding that brand language, the one kind of recent piece of work that I'm going to speak to is the supremacy piece that I created. Uh, with a photographer named Steve Sweatpants. Um, we work together as a result of what's going on in the world right now. I personally felt the need to use my voice and my creativity to speak about the impact of what's happening in the world, to try and make people focus on, just kind of stop and think about what's going on. So for me, I wanted to give you, I used typography to represent the brand of supremacy. And it was made using the Supreme logo. And also the second part of the word comes from the CVS pharmacy logo. I was just walk, walking one day and looking at it. And I was like, those two things go together. They read, they fit in a certain way. And Steve was also moved to be out in the world, shooting people, um, interacting, protesting, just being a part of the moment and documenting. So the supremacy type, I had designed it a while ago. I sketched it a very long time ago. I designed it a while ago. And it was sitting in my sketchbook. And when I saw this particular image that he had taken, that's when I knew that I had to put this together. And, and this was the end result. And instead of having it live online, we wanted to make this a backdrop um, for people to express themselves or stop and see it in the world and engage with it however they saw fit. It's wonderful to me to see people um, take photos, shoot videos in front of it, perform poetry, whatever it is that they choose to do. There's stuff that's online um, with the hashtag, um, who protects me from you, that has some small interactions. A lot of it is not really documented, but it's great to be able to have um, the ability to share things in the world that way, not only to create the piece in its own right, but to use my expression as a platform to encourage others to use their voices. So, so those are some of the things that inspire me, that make me feel good about uh, using my voice and, and speaking authentically through emotion.